Good afternoon and welcome. Hey everyone, thanks for being here. I'm Cassie May, the dance oral history producer and a librarian with the Jerome Robbins Dance Division. Um, please silence your cell phones right now and also in the event of emergency, um, there, there are exits marked with the exit signs. Um, thank you so much for being here on this really historic occasion. Um, as we begin this program, please join me in considering that today we are gathered in Lenape Hoking, the unceded land of the Lenape peoples who were violently displaced as the result of European settler colonialism over the course of 400 years. The Lenape are a diasporic people that remain closely connected to this land and are its rightful stewards. Additionally, let us reflect that prior to the construction of Lincoln Center in 1959, the San Juan Hill neighborhood in this area was destroyed, which displaced the, a community of largely populated by Latinx and black families. On behalf of the Jerome Robbins Dance Division, I ask you to join us in paying our respects to all these peoples, their elders, ancestors, and future generations, and acknowledge their ongoing contributions to this area. We realize that acknowledgement is not enough, but in naming this history, we can start to confront and dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and racism from which the Jerome Robbins Dance Division has benefited. So once again, I'm Cassie May, and I have the incredible honor of producing the Dance Division's ongoing oral history project. It's one of the ways that the division actively documents the history of this ephemeral art form, and we do this alongside the recording of dance performances through the Original Documentations program. Since 1974, the Dance Oral History Project has been initiating and recording the cherished stories and memories of dance artists, dance collaborators and workers across a broad variety of dance styles and genres. These multi-session interviews, often between five to seven hours in length, so they're long, um, are the spoken memoirs that vividly bring to life the personalities, creative process, and relationships that shape the course of dance history. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we received generous funding from the Howard Gilman Foundation to launch and sustain a series of oral histories which focus on groundbreaking and influential figures of street, club, and early hip-hop dance styles beginning in the 1970s. We wanted to center the perspectives of street and club dance artists for this project, so we partnered with artist liaisons who are all active in preserving the legacy of hip-hop dance styles. During the launch year in 2020, um, we were Absolutely, I was absolutely thrilled to work with acclaimed hip hop dance artists Gabrielle Quickstep Dionisio and Anna Rockefeller Garcia. Along with conducting several of the oral histories, they've contributed essential guidance on selecting and inviting the dance elders in the street and club dance communities to contribute their life stories to the archives. Quickstep and Rockefeller were crucial in helping us record the first five oral histories in this series that we're going to share clips from today. As Quickstep recently expressed, for Afro-diasporic people, word of mouth is key to passing along artistic and cultural history. And this is undeniably true, especially for how we reflect back and continue to uncover hip-hop dance history as we enter its sixth decade. Woo! Um, since 2020, the project has continued to record street and club oral histories with our subsequent artist liaisons, Michelle Bird McPhee, Latasha Barnes, and Miri Park. And we're now up to 20 long form oral histories and counting. Um, these will be made broadly available to the public in the near future, and for now, the Dance Division staff can make any of the street dance oral histories available in the reading room up on the third floor. So please come back and check us out. 
On this celebratory day, we also would like you to know that this, is, this oral history initiative is among others that the dance division is undertaking to nourish the historic legacies of street, club, and hip hop dance communities. We've begun to collect archival materials and the collections of hip hop artists, as well as offer dance residencies at the library focused on the history of street and club dance genres. As one of the world's largest archives for dance of all forms, we hope you'll come to think of us as your dance home. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage our hosts for today, my collaborators and interviewers for our first season of Street and Club Dance Oral Histories, Gabrielle Quickstep Dionisio and Ana Rockefeller Garcia. Let me give their bios. Quick Step, aka DJ KS360, started dancing as a child influenced by Soul Train and block parties in New York City. Over the years, he grew to join the ranks of well-known street dancers and breakers who traveled around the world, sharing the ethos of hip hop culture as it evolved. In 1992, he founded Full Circle Production, which was then reestablished in 1996 as a non-profit dance company and Hip Hop Collective, along with Rockefeller, his wife and collaborator, and Violetta Galagarza. He DJs, produces music for shows and local MCs, and is frequently hired to judge and teach master classes for breakdancing competitions worldwide. Presently, he is an adjunct professor in the dance department at Queens College. Quickstep is also working with Rockefeller on a national project called the United Hip Hop Vanguard to uplift the cultural aspects of breaking in the US. And they recently aired a second, second season of their collaborative TV show on BronxNet TV called Quick to Rock. Yeah. yeah. And then Rockefeller is a New York City native who began dancing in school talent shows and then developed as a street hitter performer. She's a well-known advocate for women in hip hop dance over the past three decades and has appeared in several music videos and films. As a co-founder and director of Full Circle Productions, she has created original theater pieces, poetry, and local dance events. In 2009, she directed the acclaimed documentary about B-Girls called All the Ladies Say. She judges international breakdance competitions, is a professor at the New School, and a hip-hop dance instructor at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Rockefeller has a collaborative t-shirt line with Japanese graffiti writer Shiro called Shiraka. <laughs> and she recently premiered a new dance work, Beauty Meets Beast, to help explore the duality of women in street and club dance. Without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. One, two, one, two. One, one, one. One. One, two, one, two. One, thank two, you, Thank you, Cassie. Jet, for that wonderful introduction. I had told her, uh, you, you should edit down our bios. They're way too long and we can just cut to the chase. But <laughs> we're so excited to be here. This is a milestone moment. Y'all make some noise for the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're really proud to be here. Um, you know, I, I, I used to dance right in front of here to make money to pay rent. And if I had to do it, I would still do it. But we had to make our way indoors to institutions such as this one to make sure that our history you know, is laid down because 500 years from now, when they celebrate the 500th year of hip hop, <laughs> we wanna make sure that these histories are available to everyone. So we gotta plant the seeds now so the orchard of hip hop can affect generations many years from now. And so without further ado, we want to introduce to y'all our five first oral history uh, dance masters. Please make some noise for Charlie Rock. Charlie Rock, yeah. Make some noise for Violeta Galagarza. V from KR3Ts. You can sit right there, brother. Make some noise for Float Master John. Hello, committee. Y'all make some noise for Kim Holmes. Kim Holmes. Get it, sister. Y'all give it up for Buddha Stretch. Buddha Stretch. Elite Force Mop Tops. Yes. 
Oh, is that what it is? Hold up. Y'all can get your money's worth tonight. <laughs> okay. I'm the judge. The judge is the audience. Y'all can make some noise for who did it better. <laughs> um, so what these five illustrious beings that are in front of you have done is impact the world of New York City hip hop street and club dance. So please give it up one more time for them. What, what, Lindy, what Lindy Hop and Swing and Tap is to a particular generation, this is what they are to our generation. These are poppers, lockers, party dancers, club goers, and they lay down a lot of history. When I used to hear the stories about the Audubon Ballroom, the Cotton Club, you know, and the Harlem Nights that were happening, this was happening all over New York City, but it stemmed from the Bronx. And when it made its way downtown, like, you know, Harlem World, and to Roseland, and to the Fun House, you know, Skate Key, I was a little kid making sure that I was gonna be part of that history. And that was an amazing history that I'm a part of that comes from these people right here. And this is multi-generational. This is incredible. I want to ask your age, Charlie Rock, how old are you at this point? I am 63. 63, 63 y'all. <laughs> Which is why sometimes we want to say that this is the 50-ish. Right. And that's Dr. Imani Kai Johnson who coined that. This is the 50-ish right. anniversary of hip hop because we have people who were doing it right before that 50 year mark of this Friday. Just after. Right? Yeah, so just after, we just right. wanna make sure that we're um, giving amplitude to what is known as hip hop, but to know that August 11th, 1973 is one party that happened of a few that were already happening and that you have people like yourself, like Trixie, where are you at? Right there. Trixie Dancing is Doug, Dancing Doug Dancing right there. Doug. Chip, Chip right there. What's up, we, Chip? We won't ask you your ages, but you know, we know you're on the sixth floor. Sixth floor. <laughs> the sixth floor with Charlie Rock. <laughs> five, five. Oh, five floor, five floor, five floor. okay. But no matter what age you are, like if he says I'm 63, we don't put an age on it, we put a version on it. So he's 6.3. <laughs> And so what we are going to do now is, uh, before we speak to each of the panelists here, we're gonna show a clip of the actual oral archive that everyone here will be able to access later once it is launched officially, so that you can capture a, a, just a segment of their interview. Um, and then we're gonna um, speak to the dance masters so we can get a little deeper about either that moment or just what it means to be included in an oral archive at the New York Public Library. And so the first clip that we are going to show is of Charlie Rock. So if we can dim the lights and then press play. Burning. It's freestyling, but that element of disrespecting the other dancer is a part of it. You know, that's where the competition of it comes in. You know, you do a fly move, then, you know, doing something like screwing somebody's head off, pretending you're screwing their head off, or, and kicking it down the block or something, or mushing the mush, you know, which is where a lot of fights start, and you put your face, hand in somebody's face, and mush, you know. Mm -hmm. I, the only time I ever got burned was by a dude named Jerry Dunlap. Right, mm -hmm. the Bronx science. And my friends from science, I was burning everybody and everything. They brought him for me specifically. And Jerry Dunn, <laughs> I remember the Bush, the one. How do you win it, huh? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And they said, we got somebody for you. We laugh about that to this day because I'm still close to my Bronx science friends. Jerry died, but we, 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 we were all still tight. And they said, yeah, Charlie, we had to get somebody for you, <laughs> you know? And I laughed about it. Uh, and the move that Jerry did, we really got me, he was eating a yeah, potato chips and he was dancing to Love the Life You Live, the Black Heat version. Because you know there's two versions, full of the gang, it's black. The Black Heat version has the real long break to it. Okay. And Jerry did this thing and he was eating a thing of potato chips and he took potato chip apple chips and mushed it in my face. Yo, that was like, yeah, man. So burning could get really ugly. All right, now, so, but, but you know what that did? 
That made me go back to the woodshed. You know, I can good here, but you know, I, I got, you know, so I'm practicing doing whatever and I became who I am today, the beast. Who I wanted. That wasn't that wasn't confrontational to you and taking a bag of chips and he's like, was confrontation. Yeah, I lost. Okay. Yeah, it was competition. It was, uh, you know, I was a fighter. No, not competition. I mean, confrontational. You didn't want to fight after that? Confrontational, but that's part of burning. Okay. That's part of burning. So, you know, burning was that, and, and fights did start. Fights did start. I wasn't going to start with in Bronx Science, but, you know, I just had to take the loss. But, like I said, that made me even better. And mm -hmm. then, what happened, too, Burning in that manner kind of went out. Right. And that's when you start seeing the modern people. And where I first saw that was going to a cool hurt party. Uh, me and my boys from Gun Hill, the Gun Hill crew. And, you know, they knew about me dancing because my sister told them. They said, my brother's good. He'd he be in the house dancing. You should. And so they saw me dancing. They said, come on, it's a cool hurt party. And I knew about cool hurt because I used to play ball with Roberto Clemente. And I remember waiting one night because they had seen, you know, the night center, which is older kids. And we're waiting for it to open. And still was playing Love Hangover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm like, yo, that's nice. What's that? And he said, that's Love Hangover. And he says, Diana Ross. I said, who? Diana Ross? He said, yeah, yeah. This and I'm like, okay, cool. And then he's talking about going to Cool Herc Park. I'm like, who's Cool Herc? He said, you don't know who Cool Herc is? I said, nah. He said, yo, that's the place in the Hebelo. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm not on that side. I'm from Gun Hill. Right? So what about this dude, Cool Herc? And then when I'm with my boy Seti and them, they're going to Cool Herc parties. So they're like, how you coming to school Herc parties? So the first Cool Herc party I went to was the Hebelo. And that's the first time I saw the twins in Clark Kent. And these guys already had names. Like, they were known. Right? And Clark Kent okay. looks like Clark Kent. He used to wear one room glasses. He still wears it. He wears one room glasses, lights in, and you know, and, and he was a monster. A monster. And the twins, you know about Devin and Keith. Yes. And uh, they used to do all these routines, but they used to spin up. People talk about what well, they did spin up. Yes, they did. I saw it. I'm not telling you what I heard. I saw it. But the thing was, when I saw all of them and the amazing Bobo, James Bond, James Bond used to do the Get Smart joint on the bottom floor and sit and take off his shoe and die like it's called like Get Look, Smart. Look, man, I, I'm getting chills right now from what you're saying. <laughs> Break Easy, what's up, man? Shout out to Break Easy from Brooklyn in the house. Y'all give it up for another OG from Brooklyn. Yeah. So, what did you think about that clip? <laughs> Crazy, right? A lot of knowledge, a lot it, of knowledge. It's a, it's, it's a deep dive into who really laid the blueprint to what this is today, right? So, without a blueprint, you can't have a building. You're going to be building in the air, and when, when you step back, it's going to be crooked as hell. It's going to be to the side, right? You have architects. These are the architects. These are part of, this is one of the architects. Give it up, man. Give it up. How does that make you feel seeing this? Huh? How does that make you feel seeing yourself? It's my first time seeing it. Oh. This is my first time seeing it. So, <coughs> and I remember, and I, at the time I was working at Bronxworks. And I'm like, oh, they, that's right, he did this in my, in, in my office. Yeah, then I remembered, you know, you know, you get those senior moments. You know. <laughs> And so it was like interesting seeing it, you know. You're immortalized forever. That and part is the part that's isn't that amazing deep? to me. And you know? I bet you didn't think that when you were dancing all no, throughout the years. Let me tell you, you know, we've talked about this. You know, all the stuff we were doing back then falls under the category of who knew. You know what I mean? Like, we had no idea that b-boying uh, or hip-hop what came to be known as hip-hop was going to be have this cultural impact 
that it has. And it's a youth culture. You know, like, like I'm 63. The people who talk, you know, we weren't around, like the people who were really doing their thing, they weren't born yet, some of them. You know what I mean? So it's just, it makes me smile. You know, because cause, like I said, I had no idea that we would have that kind of impact. We were just kids having a good time and we were rebellious because even the other kids, some kids our age, who were into the disco thing, you know, they, they were like, what are these dudes doing? They're rolling on the floor. That wasn't what we were doing. We, they, you know, there was style to it. Style, right. You know, there was style to what we were doing. But as far as they were concerned, we were rolling on the floor. And that's the distinction between disco DJs and what came to be hip hop DJs. Tell them, tell them, tell them. You know, it was, it was, they didn't want us in the clubs. They say whatever they want to say, because all of a sudden everybody's jumping on the bandwagon now. Okay. You know. <laughs> Truth. Yeah. Why, you know. Why was Doug the first one to clap on that? <laughs> right, but that's the way they they jumping on the bandwagon, like oh I was a hip hop. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. Because you didn't even want us in your clubs, you know. And that's not to say that you weren't good at what you were doing, but you weren't doing it for us, you know. And that's an important piece to this. They were not doing it for us. They did not want us in their clubs. They didn't want anything. It's it's the thing I've compared it to is like. This bastard child, excuse my language, um, and you don't want nothing to do with him. All of a sudden, he makes it to the NBA, and now this is my long lost kid, <laughs> who I always loved. Mm, you that know. part, it's the same thing. Yeah, you know. All of a sudden, you want to claim it, you know. And 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 you know, there are people like Trixie, like myself, and many others, Dancing Doug, who like. Uh, Hold up, homeboy, you know, you doing what you was doing, but you weren't doing that. You know what I mean? You, you didn't want anything to do with us. But as we became the dominant culture, because disco died out, you know, I mean, there's no real way to put it. So if you're, if you're into systems thinking and systems theory, closed-ended systems, you know, they die out. Open-ended systems, they keep getting energy, what we call negative entropy. And um, that's my Bronx science music. Too. I love that. I love that. Charlie Rock, a.k.a. the science. scientist. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Charlie know. Rock, y'all. And, and it always has inputs. You know? We're always going to be here. You know, it's like there's going to be youth after us. And I tell the people who complain, oh, they ain't doing it. But that's, it's not your era. It's theirs. It's not your era. And so, you know, they're doing what my parents did. <laughs> you know, it was their turn. It's, it's, it's our turn now, you know? And it's their turn to be on top of it. So you hear all the cursing and everything. I'm like, listen, I may not like it, but it's not meant for me. You know, it's not geared toward me. You know? And so I have to acknowledge that. And a lot of people don't like to acknowledge that because they want to hang on, to, you know, a, you know, they want to hang on to stuff. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, everything, everything moves. Everything moves. You know, so that's the way it was. It's, it's their turn now. And their style is with all the curse, that's their business, that's their turn. It's an evolution. You know? It's definitely it's, an evolution. It's, yeah, it's like but we, anything But else. we acknowledge that we're descendants <clears throat> of what your generation did, and that's what this whole thing is about. So y'all give it up for Charlie Rock. No idea. None. None. Um, I think the next clip that we are going to screen is of Floatmaster John. So if we could dim the light. All right. <laughs>
we used to listen to a lot of radio stations and stuff like that. And this guy was, um, he was um, named, you know, he was a bump Pan Am man. And um, he had his box out there all kind of chained in a little radio. And, um, you know, we was, my mother was shopping for me and my brother that time. And, um, and I forgot what, what weather it was, but it was crowded. It was crowded on 14th Street where um, instead of Macy's, it was Mays. Oh, I remember Mays. Mays, and it was, um, I think it was Klein, or I forgot the name of that other store, S S K Klein, something like that, it was across yeah. the street. And uh, she was going, she was going down to John Barber's store, but we were the front of a shoe store. And we got off the train, and um, this guy was playing music, you know, at a low, low, real low. But it was loud enough for us to hear, you know, as we were going by. And we heard um, uh, some Akosa. Akosa, Akosa, Akosa. Yeah, so we was that. And it was the old version. So we was listening to that. And every time we hear music, we start, you know, reacting on how we act in the house when we watch uh, Soul Train. So we started doing all little moves and stuff like that, and all these other ladies and, and grandmas and stuff started watching us dance. Oh, so look at the boys go. Oh, they good, you know, and the big crowd start coming. Wow, so, that was actually your first hit? Yeah, it was the first time we danced, and then the people stood the uh, lady do some change, like, you know, <laughs> uh, put this in your hand, you know, so put that hand, and it was throwing money. And then my mom said, go over there and get a shoebox for your money don't fly away. I go, we need money. I went there. get a shoebox? Yeah, because we was in front of the shoe store. So I went inside, got the shoebox, came back out, danced a little bit more. And, um, ten. you know, I don't know what my mother, how much money, money my mother had. Because she used to bargain with us, you know, if my birthday come, She'll take us both out, and if there's a sale, she'll get them both the same clothing or whatever. And I'll get a little bit more, you know, of certain items. If it's my brother's birthday, you know, he gets a little bit more, but we'll both go because she had to get clothes for both of us because we were about the same age. I was a year older then. So, you know, she would try to, you know, make ends meet with what little money she had and at her convenience. But since uh we were dancing right there and you know that helped out you know i don't i still don't remember how much money we made that couple of seconds we made wow. a lot of in a couple of you remember what year that was it was a long time it was 70s yeah that's yeah. what i knew it was the 70s yeah it gave you some kind of indication of what kind of money you was getting you know yeah. whether it was the 70s or the 80s you know? like eight, 78 79 something like that and that song came out, you know, and it was rocking and we started popping and all that, gliding and all that little stuff that we was doing. And um, that, that was, you know, that set us off. But we went, we went and did this, you know, Wayne Bliss and uh, other dancers, they were B-boys. It was like, it was like six of us, five of us. They were the yeah, B-boys. That, that's your crew, the New York City Flow Committee. Yeah, yeah, we were the executioners. Oh, at first. At first, we were the executioners because we were the all breaking crew. There was no poppers. It was all B boys, all B boy. It was Wayne Bliss, Doug, Po Boy. Then it was me and Will, you know? And. Uh, was J5 with you? No, nobody was there. It was just us five. Okay. That's fine, because we were we came from the same neighborhood. East Harlem represent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm proud. I need that box. Test it. <laughs> you still have that magic shoe box? Oh, yours is it working? Can it's we check? Um, Float Master John's uh, microphone work? It's working. It's on, it's on. 
Go on to. There we go. Y'all hear me? I'm kind of sad because, you know, my mom's passed away a couple of um, years ago at 96. And, um, you know, during the COVID time and stuff like that. But back in the days, like I mentioned, maze and stuff like that, John, those John, were some John. hard times. A mother raising five kids, uh, four boys and one girl. And it's just one family among all the other mothers in Harlem, Brooklyn, Bronx. You know, they were losing their hair on trying to make ends meet, raising these kids around rats, roaches. I mean, you, you could name it, you know, Mel Mel said, <laughs> he said it all anyway, he explained Message. it. But, um, you know, we got a gift, a blessing by showing we can dance. You know, that was something that saved us and make ends meet where we got a blessing where we learned something that we just had fun doing and we took that and we started making ends meet with that, you know, and um, one, we didn't go to drugs. We didn't go to jail, you know. It was just something that we, at the time, it helped my mother, you know what I'm saying? And yeah, the, we were small as a shoebox because we were real small and uh, the people was throwing money. We didn't expect that to happen. But my mom was like, quick, you know? Well, I got the dancing from my moms. I got the dancing God bless from my moms. the moms, that's right. God bless the moms. God bless the moms. Yeah. Don't cover the mic. I got the dancing from my moms, and I got the music on how to fix radios or whatever for my dad. My dad was like a, um, a Sanford son. You know, <laughs> he'll, know find, he'll find is? junk in the street okay. and fix it. People throw away, don't know how to fix it. He'll fix it. TVs, stereos, you know. He would fix it. And my mother, she knew the dancing and she was a singer. So that's how the talent came through us, you know. And uh, it was it's just, it just, you know, so many memories we had to do because back in the day, there was no smoke alarms. There was no, no telephones, no internet. And um, when one house burned down, the whole block burned down. We moved from house to house. We wound up in the Ganada Hotel. Everybody know Ganada Hotel? That was in Brooklyn, that big building with the clock at. That was the Wedfield Hotel. They threw everybody in there. I mean, there was a grandfather clock in our, our apartment, and behind the, the, the clock was a hole this big. And rats came out, like 50 of them, every night, biting, scratching. I mean, that's where my poppy came from. You know, trying not to... <laughs> He's a comedian too, ladies and gentlemen. He's a comedian. He'll be here all week. <laughs> Keep it from getting bit by rats. That's where my poppy came from. But, hard but... times. It was hard times, like um, 68 and 69, going from house to house. It was real hard, you know? But eventually, in the 70s, things got better. We moved into the projects instead of tenements. And once we landed in the projects, that's where I met my friends. Um, Duggo, God bless his soul, he passed away. Rest in peace. He man. introduced me to Wayne Blizz. Wayne Blizz was a country guy. And he used to dance and listen to James Brown. And, you know, and he just went off. He was a funny guy. So we made a crew. Him, Poe, me and my brother. We were small, we couldn't afford a lot of clothes, we looked kinda dirty, so <laughs> why not break on the floor? You know, why not b-boy and this, that, that? Cause you're gonna, your clothes are dirty anyway. So, um. John, you, you managed though to influence a whole lot of hitters and when I say hitters, I mean yeah. the people who are street performing, the dancers yeah. that you see in Times Square, sometimes even in your subway car, yeah. <laughs> um, for the Broadway plays. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a hitter, I'm a descendant. Yeah. That's how I started my entire career was that way. Um, give a round of applause to Zone sitting right there who conducted the interview. Stand up, Zone. 
his, his Zones crew uh, is the Transformers. Yes. You were uh, sparking off the float committee, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, execution is first. We were B-Boys first, and then we became float committee in the 80s. But like, like Charlie Rock said, burning and battling, that was like karate movies. You battle this guy, you battle that guy, you lost, okay, you go back to the cave or whatever, and you train and you come back and beat that guy. Yeah. <laughs> he said to the cave, we learned that yeah. from Bruce Lee and all that. We learned all of that. This is what we did. We battled project to project to project to project so we could sharpen up our skills. And then after hitting, we went down to Roxy's and showed it off. That was the arena, Roxy's. Right. But like hip hop, the arena, the Roxy's for MCs was Harlem World. And they don't mention that. They would be, if there was no Harlem World, there'd be no Cold Crush versus Treacherous 3. There'd be no Busy B versus Kumo D. Mm -hmm. Harlem World was the epic center of ballad. You yeah. understand? But that should have been a landmark. It's, it's in our minds and it's in, we're gonna continue to talk about um, those milestones and those moments. Um, Y'all give it up for Floatmaster John. Yeah. So we're going on to the next clip and the next clip is, is gonna be Violeta Galagarza is the Violet. next clip that we're gonna show next. So, yep, give it up. Yep. <laughs> give it up for the ladies in hip hop, y'all. That's when it all started at the age of 17, going to LaGuardia Corsi House and having rehearsals there, and then the director giving me an ultimatum there as well. Hey, Violet, I see you rehearsing, but now we have this professional ballet company, and they're willing to come and take over and bring portable floors. You can come join them, or you can come have your own dance company, but I, I would need you to do a Broadway show. And I'm like, what? Wow. So now you're giving me an ultimatum. I used to come here and rehearse, for little shows here and there. This will be our rehearsal space, a block away from my block. During that time, it was the drug epidemic, you know, drug addicts in the corner. So of course my mom wouldn't allow me to go far or the babysitting situation. So I'll always bring my son there. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I didn't have nobody who knew about Broadway. Again, we didn't have the social media, no way for me to learn. So I was like, okay, I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll do it. Just so they didn't take that away from me. And that from 12 dances became 60 dances in, in three months. I, I was doing costumes, what I've experienced with my sister, cutting cassette tapes, taping them, um, doing cake sales. Back then it was cake sales. That's how we survived in doing our shows. And um, at that time, who's a legend now, Tess Smooth, he was my DJ, he would bring his equipment, Jibo the Pro, another icon legend, and they would help me with the equipment part, and I had over 60 dancers and backstage and being the host and promoting this event by flyers, black and white, like you, what you posted, the black and white graffiti, and we sold out, 360 people came. I had nine different choreographies, and, I, and dancing myself, hosting it and everything, at the end, the director sitting in the middle of the, the audience and when it finished, he walks up to the stage and looks up to me and I, I come down and I'm like, so James, his name was James Sola. So what do you think, is this great? Did you like it? He was like, oh my God, this was amazing. Are you ready for next year? And I'm like, you crazy? No more. I have my kid, this was too much. And but it's 30 years now with my organization of that challenge that he gave me, was able to develop other greatest uh, uh, gifts that I didn't know I had in being a coordinator, costume designer, host, DJ, e editor, you know, doing fundraisers. It was amazing. And that's how I was able to channel, channel that and 
challenge my dancers as I went on with my life. Okay, this is gonna help others. I'll discover what they're great at. You, we may not think, we may think I'm gonna be a, a nurse, but then now they're a surgeon, now there's something else. It's totally opposite. Right. Wow, no, that's amazing. And I think everybody has those like weird life changing, like boom, Shift. Change, uh, the direction of where you were going. Yeah, you were going this way and then bam. Can, can I, it's an obstacle, but you did. Yes, yes. Can, can I can share add. with you that what you was asking me about the whole change and shift and being young and being a mom, I have to be grateful and thankful that I had a mom that was dedicated um, in her beliefs because if I was famous and graduated and did and gone on tour, I would have been bougie and so important that I didn't even maybe had the time to come back to my community. But because of that change in my life of something that I thought that was bad, because I wanted to not be a statistic and be that Latina girl from the hood who didn't finish college or school, for to a situation that I had no choice but to stay stuck in my community, but I have a son who's now 33 years old, who finished college, graduated, degree, honors, um, have two girls, I have three boys now, and he has a house and he's working on a pool in the back. My dreams went to the blessing of what my, thanks to my mom who raised me to having my son and being with my community and saving souls or inspiring others, you know? Ooh. Once again, the moms, the mothers out here, a lot of that these dancers. That almost made me cry. Oh, good. good. Uh, you can't understand much what I'm saying because it was through the question that she was asking, but my mom, I was adopted, and then at a young age, I had my son, and I didn't want to have the child because I felt I was too young. I wanted to finish school, college and all, and not be a statistic. That's where that came from. And if it wasn't for her, that path went left. I'm still that dancer. I didn't stop. I'm installing it to everyone else, passing it down, passing the torch. And that's now 33 years of my dance company. But before that, I was in the streets doing the same thing, going to jams, parks, battling, you know, Roseland, Devil's Nest, downtown Palladium. I was everywhere. At 15, we were able to do that. Fake IDs. Fake IDs, Fake IDs. Fake IDs on Times Square, $60. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> um, Violet, I just wanted to ask you, you know, how does it feel now, looking back, um, with all the trials and tribulations? I know that when I, when I heard about you, they had said, there's this girl from East Harlem, V. And then when I met you, you were like, yeah, I'm all about body positive. I'm about women of any, you know, body shape, body type. Um, when you look back, you know, do you feel like that was a conscious choice or you were like, kind of challenged to be that spokesperson? So I came from Alvinelli, right? At nine years old, I was doing the hustle already. My sisters were hustle dancers and I was inspired. And they used to use me as a guinea pig and went to school and from there, they told me, you, need, you should audition to this place. And I didn't know I was at a stage. Audition the next day, I made it for Alvinelli four years. I was amazing. I hit it, ballet, modern, jazz, and African. I killed every class, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, things happen in life, and at 15, I found, I thought the love of my life, and he found me, and things happen, and in a year, I became a mom, and that's when I just, like, wow. Now, they're not gonna take me back in Alvinelli, because I was 120, 125, um, and uh, that year, I was, after I gave birth, I was back 150, you know? And so, I was like, Again, something being taken away from me. So I always felt like, you know, since young, again, my life was gonna be taken away because my mom couldn't. She was making a decision and my aunt saved my life. So I said, you know what? If they don't accept me over there, I'm just gonna make it here in my block and, and you know, do what I do. And I used to be in the block, 117, and 
the DJ will come from the second floor, bring his equipment down, the pole, plug it, and we used to jam. Everybody was like, yo, what's the next step? What's the next style? What's the cabbage track, yo, V, yo, teachers. And I used to be hype. I was like, oh, I got my own Alvinelli over here. <laughs> you know? And um, throughout the years of being, trying to be the mom and still trying to love what I do and continue what, purpose I have here and at 17 I went through that domestic violence situation and a curve came where I was like that James Sola he was like well Violet we're gonna just uh, bring a ballet company I'm like in my mind I'm like no you're not I'm not gonna let this happen again and I did it took the challenge and with my son I have three boys now um, I'm still 25 everybody knows that but, <laughs> but I just felt that being thick as a woman before that is Lizzo and everybody else does it now, but I was the one, even in the parade, dancing thick with heels, Latina, they used to be like, go Gorda, go Gorda. I used to be like, yeah, that's right, this Gorda story gets up. <laughs> Just to inspire other thick women, women that were moms that thought, okay, I'm a mom, now I gotta stick to this Av. No, you could still do it. I did it, I'm still doing it. And I'm not a mom now, I'm a student. I be asking my dancers like, can I learn please? Can you, my son, I'm like, no I can't, what do you think, did I do good? So it's good, now it's you know, back to being young. Y'all give it up for Violet, y'all yeah, give it up for yeah, Violet. Up. Wow. So now it's like what, what you said, I'm sorry real quick, it's just training amateurs to become professionals, challenging them in the lifestyles of what they do, what they think they're not good at, I'll challenge and put them in that place and elevate and train them all styles of dance. And many of them, as many know, they're all over traveling all over the world or here still teaching and doing what they do most and best. Nice. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. One, one thing we're I want to mention. Oh, we're, we're, we were going to move on to the next She's clip. She's in my but. building. We live in the same building. She live on the sixth floor. Hey, I live on the eighth floor. So I, I would see him there. I'm like, what are you doing here? My mom lives here. My mom lives here too. <laughs> you know, neighbors. Neighbors. Hip hop neighbors. Dance fam. You would never know. Right. We are going to move to the next clip, which is the clip of Buddha Stretch. Buddha Stretch. Hey. Like I said, after doing Union Square, um, and then Union Square closed, and we went on to perform at the Latin Quarters. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a friend of mine that I met who was also a uh, popper, my man Cliff Love, I had met him back in 84 at the Roxy. Mm -hmm. He was working as a busboy there. When he quit, I got that job. And so he saw our performance. He went on to start uh, touring with Houdini. And he did the Raising Hell tour with Houdini, LL, Run DMC, and the BC Boys. So I, I had went to see him. I had seen him perform at Madison Square Garden in 86. Okay. And then he came to Union Square and saw me perform. And so he told Jalil, you got to get this guy. You need, we need to be doing that on this stage. That's what you need on this stage now. And so that set in motion for, you know, uh, me to, to come full circle from the Fresh Fest. <laughs> Supposed to do the Fresh Fest, didn't. Came back around to Houdini anyway. And I got to go on to a tour called the Death Jam Tour. With LL Cool okay. J, Houdini, Public Enemy, Eric B and Rock Kim, and Stessa Sonnet, with some appearances with Dougie Fresh, with uh, Roxanne Shante, Heavy D and the Boys, uh, Jesse Jeff and the Fresh Prince. You know, they, we had different people on and off of that tour. Too Short, right. MC Hammer, when we were on the West Coast. You know, so I got to meet all of these people going on tour with Houdini. You know, and that was because of Cliff seeing 
me perform at Union Square and seeing that this is what Houdini does, they need to get this, make the transition now to, to having this dance as a part of their show. Right. And he he told Jalil, and then just so happens, I run into them um, at home and Flatbush just hanging in front of my door and they're walking by. It's Cliff and Jalil. And I holler like, yo, Cliff, what up? He's like, yo, Strength. And he's like, Jalil, this is my man. This is who I was telling you about. And I'm like, word, you was telling him about me? Like, what's up? Run into them. And it's crazy. I ran into them then. Then, you know, they were walking through Flatbush. And then I went to my boy Trudy's house, who lived uh, not far from me. I'm walking up Church Avenue in Flatbush. On my way back from his house, going back to my house, I'm walking up Church Avenue. And I hear somebody calling me, yo, stretch from the window. And it's Jalil. It's Jalil and Cliff in somebody's house that they knew. And they see me walking by. It's the second time I run into them in the same day. And they're saying, what's up? And Jalil is like, yeah, man, I'm going to get you on our joint. And I'm laughing like, yeah, I, you know, because I don't know. It's just bullshit to me. And literally, like, a week or so passed, and I get the call. And they're sending me a flight ticket to come down to uh, uh, South Carolina. I think it was South Carolina mm-hmm. for the first show. And I get to go on tour with Houdini from that point on. And now I'm doing the, I'm dancing with them and I have to put together the, the choreography. They already have choreography for some of their songs. But then some of the other songs, now I'm dancing. So me and Cliff have to come up. It was me, Cliff, and another brother by the name of Lance Romance, who was all, all already there with Cliff prior to me getting there. And now I have to put together the choreography for us three to dance with Houdini. And then Lance quit. And it was just me and Cliff. So now I'm doing, you know, the choreography for them and I'm performing with them on the tour for like a year and a half. Wow. And I'm, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting with all these other rap groups and now they're seeing what we do, freestyle hip hop for the first time. And they're like, everybody's seeing Houdini's show and it's like, oh, that show was crazy. And, and, you know, this dude is nice. These dude hit Cliff Love and that new kid Stretch, they rock it. You know, so that became the template for the the rappers after that. Yes. Brother Stretch. Did you ever think you would come, would you would come from the Brooklyn streets and end up going on tour around the world? Test the one. Two, two. In no way, shape, or form. Never in my wildest dreams. I mean, it's still, just to be sitting here, to listen to Charlie Rock, to, you know, be with, in the presence of Dancing Doug, and Trixie, and Chip, and to sit here and have this conversation is still uh, hilarious to me, because my pops used to kick me out the house for this. So, you know, I'm still, I'm still pinching myself laughing like, wow. And I still laugh because my pops, he still laughs at the fact that I'm still doing this. You got to pinch You're right. it. Y'all remember the video? Remember, uh, remember the time? Choreographer right there. So Bronx has a lot of history, but Brooklyn has a lot of history in hip hop too. We're from Brooklyn. Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Bronx, Harlem, right? So, and we're hitters. Hitter right here. Hitter. Hitter. So when we hit, it was to hit people. We hit the concrete, but we hit people's pockets so we can get paid. <laughs> but we've also hit hits on stage from the block to rock the planet. And somebody from Brooklyn would never think that they were going to be on the stage and affect people for generations to come and still be here and not be a statistic, uh, statistic right? When you're a statistic, you're just a number. But when you're a dancer, you are a soul in motion. And these souls in motion, they're still here. And one day we're not going to be here, but this footage will be here forever. Right. You have anything else to add, Stretch? Something you want to say? Um, I just want to shout out John. Um, 
one of my partners in crime, Loose Joint, a.k.a. Young God, is a direct descendant from the float committee, you know, and he's talking about battling. That's how I met John, and I used to battle, God bless the dead, Jelly, every time I saw him. Every time. It was on site. When people talk about on site, no, we had on site. So every time I came through Times Square, if I saw them on 34th Street, on 42nd Street, I had to stop, acknowledge John and the crew, and look at Jelly and like, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. That's it. But the beauty of that also is that, you know, Stretch and a lot of everybody here had, had the ability to have one foot in the commercial realm and keep the other foot in the streets. And that's the part that's not spoken about too much. The underground, yeah. the community, keeping yourself sharp. Um, really quickly, we gotta move to the next clip, but I just wanna say that we have another great legend in the house, Peaches. Y'all give it up for Peaches. Peach, Peach. Rodriguez in the building. house. Speaking right. of statistics, I wanna, I wanna know the stats later on between you and Jelly. Okay, <laughs> all right. We're going to um, uh, screen on, the clip now of Kim Holmes' oral history. Let's talk a little bit about the Missy Elliott, Can't Stand the Rain. Uh, was that an eye-opening experience? Um, were you able to put some moves in? Uh, let's talk a little bit about your time with Missy Elliott. Well, with M M Missy, I had did uh, a couple of things before we did Camp okay. in the Rain, right? So okay. we had started working with her with the group 702, okay. right? And um, there was another artist that she was working with, but it was I was just around her for a while. So it was first you were learning about who Missy was, the he he how, you know, woman is. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, she got dope beats. And you know how Puffy was, you know, working with her and producing these, and she was producing these tracks and stuff. And that's my girlfriend Joyce um, was connected to people at Uptown Records. So, um, being or able to be around her and Lorianne, uh, we got pulled in to do um, 702's um, Stilo, right? And they were based out of um, Vegas, right? So that's what 702 is. 702, we be out, check it out, right? Um, and it was just like, oh, that's the area code. Wow, how cool was that? So we got to do um, Steve-O with them. And then they, you know, with all, everybody that she was working with, then it was just like, it's time to build Missy as an artist, not just a producer. Okay. Right. So, you know, she would, remember, she had little cameos in all of these different people's, you know, videos. But now it's, she's taking a step in, in creating a path for Missy. So in, in being around Missy during the time of Can't Stand the Rain, the most funniest thing I could remember was us, it was always about going to the video shoot and the call be so early in the morning. And then you don't work until really maybe one, two o'clock, three o'clock. Um, yeah, and, or even later than that, it's late, it's, you know, it's nighttime hours. And at that time, the biggest thing for us was they wanted to make us sexy five women, right? So that's where the big fight started. It's like, what do you mean sexy five women? We're like, aren't we sexy enough? And we had the yellow pants and, you know, some people will have their jackets open and you have the suspenders and you have the tank top, you know, the white tank tops. And, you know, and it was like, no, that's not sexy enough. And it was like, uh-oh. Uh -oh. All right now, this is starting to shift. <laughs> You know, they, they went back and forth for a while about what would sexy look like on us and also us still being, you know, respected about the dancing and what we were doing. Right. So we ended up wearing the hoodie. We, read, we wore the hoodie of the coat. Then we wore, and I always make the joke about it, the tank tops. Oh, we have Hanes boys underwear. <laughs> and then also from there, we wore Timberlands. Well, 
they were fake Timberlands. Timberlands. Uh -huh. yeah. No. Yeah. Well, you know, we can tell. Those are the things that would happen, you know, in, in video world. You know, yeah. you get some. Sometimes, like I did the Fat uh, Fat Joe video, and they had us wear all this jewelry and stuff. But then, as soon as you was finished, it went right back. You know it. You know, and they took Polaroids of you, so they were yeah. like, mm, yeah. "No, you yeah. did wear it. Give it back." <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it was. It was um, Fat Joe and R. Kelly. Okay. And I was just like, whoa, okay, this was the beginning of seeing Remy Ma. I didn't know who she was at that time. And it was just like these new people. So I had such of a great experience working with the different artists because it was seeing them before ego. It was seeing them before they become these these large conglomerates now, before they, you know, people really invested that amount of money and time with them. And, you know, they are household names now, right? Truly, yeah, famous. <laughs> it's so famous, you know, but then understanding that the dancers now have their own names and we're, you know, we have those titles. We're in people's, you know, right. like uh, we can go to Japan or we go to, um, Africa and they're like, what do you mean? Oh, Kim Holmes is here. Oh, the Rockefeller is here. Oh, oh my God, Buddha's dress. What do you mean? You don't know about them? And you know, the or you hear the Les twins and they like, no, 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 that's them. They came before us, you know. So knowing that we were breaking barriers, we were opening up doors, and and to be with Missy to for it to be 25 years later. Yes. You know, it was a it was a breakthrough for us. Give it up for Kim Holmes, y'all. And so making that transition from being the, the girl from around the block to being in these videos, like, come on, share, share a little bit of that. Check one, check two. <laughs> well, you know, we always had jokes, right? No matter where we're at, you know, you gotta have a joke because you're going through something different. So to not look, you know, like you're crazy and stuff, you have to have, you know, jokes with somebody. And um, my girlfriend, Joyce Van Hook, would always call me. Yeah, that was my partner in crime. Before I seen V, not knowing that we lived in the same area, right? Like blocks away. John, right? And it's just like, all right, um, we going to what video? All right, all right, she's gonna put me into something else, all right. <laughs> I'm getting the check though, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm down, let's go, let's go. But to know like Missy, you know, was the biggest part for us in the 25 years of being in, uh, you know, for hip hop for me was just like, wow, is, this is that big because my grandmother had me in dance at four. Um, I, hip hop, uh, no, you gonna do this ballet and you gonna do jazz and um, you better be home at this time. She didn't play. So um, meeting Marjorie, rest in uh, peace. Rest in peace, the big peace. sister, right? I met Marjorie at 15 and at my high school, and I went to Manhattan Center, right? And she came, and we were doing this talent show, and but I was looking at her and her friends that she came to the school with, and was just like, they look like they having fun. Yo, whack over here, I have to dance with y'all? I don't wanna do that. So I go over to Marge like, yo, can I dance with you? She like, can you dance? Yeah, I can dance. You know, you gotta play it off even if you didn't know, right? Yeah, I can dance. So, you know, I always uh, tell this, but my audition dance for her was the running man, right? But it was the running man with the spins, right? And I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm gonna do it. And after that, it was just like, she became, her and Joyce lived on the west side. I was from the east side. So it was just like, oh, these two women that know one another, and I get to go outside, because if she didn't come pick me up, I couldn't go outside. If you had a mother like that, right? What time y'all coming back? What? She better be here before the street lights, what? You know, come we, on, we come know on, all of that. Come on. So, but my grandmother was just like, okay, she called Marjorie Marathon. Because <laughs> Marjorie would dance all day long all day, all night. And then she will have the conversation with my grandmother just to get me out the house. Working. Not Working saying Sweet that talking. where we were going out the house. So, you know, I'm 15. She got the cards already done for us to go into the club and stuff. So, 
that's how I seen Stretch and so many other famous dancers that are, are around now. But it was just like being the little girl coming into this new world of what, this is what I'm supposed to be a part of. And not knowing that at the end of the day, years later, that we would be here, you know, to open up more doors for the next generation and then also have history, right? Because now we leave our legacy in a new way um, for the generations coming back, you know? So it was being at the tunnel. The tunnel was everything for everybody at yeah. any time that you went. I don't care if it was hip hop night, I don't care if it was house night, I don't care. Whatever night it was, if you went to the tunnel, it was an experience. And Every you couldn't night. wait, you couldn't wait to go to school that Monday Tell everybody. and talk about it. <laughs> and I was the person that was just like, oh, okay, you better not say nothing. Cause if you see me, I'm not supposed to be seen. My grandmother <laughs> killed me. Please don't talk, please don't tell anybody. But the one time we did go and we was showing the ID and Marjorie looked and she was like, how are you gonna say that you older than me? And I was like, I don't know, the guy just asked and the number came out, 21. I was 16, I was 16. But from there it was just like, that's where you met everybody that danced, that's where you met the promoters, people watching you all over the place, you know, in so many different clubs. Um, that we went to. But on the commercial aspect of it, it was knowing that my grandmother put me in dance for grace and discipline. She said all little girls needed it, right? And as we think about it now, as we get older, you do need discipline, right? To do any of these dance moves that we do, whether you're in your right mind or not, <laughs> you have to be disciplined so you don't hurt yourself, right? Time, this, it, it was just like everything worked hand in hand. And then and being around like these different artists, um, rappers and, and musicians, it became like this was a new way of life. But not knowing, you know, as we started doing research more and more that it was already our families doing this and they already set us up for it, right? We didn't know we were just kids, having a good time, having fun. But then somebody gives you a challenge like, oh, could you do the show? Oh, could you, uh, could you um, choreograph for this person? You know, mine was um, taking over a dance class, right? Learning how to teach a dance class. I don't wanna do that. <laughs> well, if you don't do it, I'm gonna call your grandmother. No problem. No problem, I got this. I was, I was the one that she had the fear of, I had the fear of God for my grandmother. Another mother, so, we all give it up to the mothers. Yeah. <laughs> And with the chancla, huh? With with the chancla, yeah. But you used to hear her come through. <laughs> and and, and it'd be like five, six, seven, eight. You learning how to do this, and she would watch me. And um, may she rest in peace. This would have been her hundredth birthday this year. And God uh, bless. Rest in peace. The 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 peace that I have now, because I always used to get nervous going on stage like I'm nervous right now talking, right, you, the, the mic is shaking. Um, it was, you knew that you had the ancestors and everybody behind you, right? And if you got on that stage, you better show what the people wanted you to show. Cause if not, you get booed like the Apollo, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you gotta go back in the cave, right? I would close my door for hours. She'd be like, what's she doing in there? I don't know what she doing in there. I hear all this stuff, this loud music. I open up the door, she ain't moving. Because I'm preparing to go for the next battle. Because I can't lose. Because you got the block that's like, yo. This one right here till this day. Yo. Yo, that's my sister from another messed up. You better not play with her. It's, it's the both of us. That's how it went down. So, like, for me right now to have this wonderful, you know, experience with y'all, knowing that we're the first of being oral historians, we've been doing it anyway. But now for it to be here, it's, a, it's so, it's overwhelming, but it's a blessing that we never seen coming. And, you know, we get, a, you know, uncomfortable. Y'all know me, y'all know your sister. I don't wanna do it, I'm not coming. No, it don't feel right. Why she got an attitude? But now it's, I have the attitude because I'm seeing things in a different light, different perspective to bring things forward. So. Well, thank you for gracing us. Y'all give it up for Kim Holmes. 
So they're giving me the wrap-up sign, and though you know we could keep going. You know that once this oral archive goes live, you will see all their stories, not just the little clip that we have in there. It, it was like some, I think it was hours, right? Like two hours, one hour for some of you, right? <laughs> and um, we, they're gonna go now and join us in the outdoor event that we're gonna do where there's a top eight, they will be the judges. But feel free to follow them or reach out to them because all of these people here uh, blaze the trail. And we yep. did not know what we were doing. But somehow we did it. We did something amazing. And so I just want to make sure that you all walk away knowing that all of us here had a calling. And these people right here, their stories are forever, forever. digitally archived. And next time, yes. Next time you go to the movies, you know, you see the Marvel comics and you see all of the superheroes coming at you on the screen. Next time you see that, replace that with dancers. Yeah, that's many more. There's many more. And we belong that's to one another. We're all dance family. Thank you for coming. We one, love y'all. One, two, real quick. Wait, wait, wait. And real quick. Yeah, yeah. I just got to say this. Uh, you know, I, uh, I have to quote my dad, and I have to give my dad and all the other black dads, myself including, included, props because we don't get credit for being fathers. I'm a father of two daughters. Oh. My daughters, I took my daughters to Alvin Ailey too mm. because that's where they needed to go. Mm -hmm. And I want to give a shout out to all the black fathers who don't yes. give yep, yep. credit that they yes. deserve. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Stretch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One more, I'm one last comment. I'm listening to all these accomplishments that you guys did and professional. It's fun. None of that existed. Yeah. Not with us. It didn't about. exist for us. It was like, you know, we were just doing our thing in the street and that was it. Yep. It was and I'm talking about not even getting money thrown in this. Nothing. It was just, you know, we're the first celebrities of it. Yes, you and are. And what we call, you know. Yeah. yeah. Our celebrity was, yo, there's there's Trixie. Little kids like this trick little little people. I had a big ego, yeah, huge. So I used to walk through the train knowing that I'll be recognized by somebody. No money involved, just, you know, street rap. The love street cred. Street cred. Y'all are our heroes, though. Well, know that. Yeah. You are our, y'all are our right. heroes. You are sure. forever no our heroes. Well, thanks to that Lincoln Center to give us that opportunity. The New York Public Library, thank you.